Let's get started. Uh, good morning, everybody. Okay, thank you. You guys may be seated. All right. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, a couple things. Uh, we, uh, we do have a special chapel. We have a combined Easter chapel. And uh, uh, fourth and fifth graders, there's something that you guys may be able uh, to look forward to and, uh, when you guys get to middle school, and that's worship elective. So we're going to start off. All right, we're going to start off with the... Uh, now, there's about a dozen students in worship elective, so we have to kind of rotate. But I'm going to go ahead and invite our worship elective to co go ahead and come up here. And uh, as they come up, they're going to give them a round of applause, okay? Okay, our worship elective, they've been leading, uh, you know, so fourth and fifth graders, you guys may notice that when you guys come to chapel, it's, it's uh, the teachers that are leading worship, but in middle school, we have the students uh, leading worship, and they do a fantastic job. So uh, let's go ahead and open up in prayer, and we're going to get started. Thank you, Jesus, that, uh, for this day that you have made. And God, I just thank you for your death and resurrection on the cross so we could have connection with you. And so, Lord, we just commemorate uh, Easter for what it is, and we'll learn more about it today. Uh, but Lord, may we just continue to commune with you, get to know you uh, better. And Lord, may we just continue to build our relationship with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. We all say, amen. amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you. 
I'm going to go ahead and introduce our, uh, uh, our chaplain here, our middle school chaplain. Okay, it's Pastor Toby. Uh, so, uh, you, you know, I forgot to tell you guys to stand up before we worship. So usually we stand up and, during worship and interact a little bit more. But guys, let's give another round of applause. I know it's a little scary for the worship elective to come up. Okay. Oh, excuse me. All right. Well, uh, I'm going to have Pastor Toby come out. I was looking for you. I thought, I thought I had to stall, but you're right there. <laughs> you're hiding. Okay, go ahead. Uh, give him a round of applause as he comes out. <laughs> give me one second. Well, good morning, students. Yeah, so good to see you guys. If you're in middle school, have a seat. If you're fourth or fifth grade, stay standing. I know you guys don't, you fourth and fifth graders don't know me as well. And so I want to give you guys a chance to ask me any question you want. And I will give you my honest answer. I'm only going to take questions from fourth and fifth graders. All right, so if anybody has any question at all, go ahead and ask me, and I'll be super honest with you. Yes, what's your name? Aiden. Aiden, Aiden and Aiden, what's your question? Do you know Amber Jew? Do I know Amber Jew? Yes, I do know Jambers, um, and she is a senior, correct? And she'll be going off to college next year. Do you know what college she's going to go to next year? USC, give it up for Jambers, all right, cool, cool, all right, another question from a fourth or fifth grade, oh, yes, what's your name? Sean, Sean, what is your question? My favorite color, great, 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 great question, my favorite color is called the essence of Toby, it's a color that I made up, it's a color that I made up in middle school during a watercolor painting class, and um, it's close to teal, but not. And so I, called, I couldn't find it on a color chart, so I named it the essence of Toby. All right, good question. One last question. Yes, what's your name? Jolene. All right, Jolene, what's your question? What's my favorite subject? All right. Um... Does lunch count as a subject? No? No. Okay, lunch does not count as a subject. Uh, I would have to say either arts or PE. Art or PE would be my favorite subjects. All right? Good questions. Why don't you guys have a seat? Uh, you guys asked some very good questions. Uh, I want to ask you guys a question now. How many of you guys like food? Raise your hand. Cool. Yell at me. What kind of foods do you guys like? I heard pizza, ice cream, pizza, apples, apples, all right, beef, strawberries, human souls, wow, that, that elevated real fast, all right, well, all right, quiet down, quiet down, uh, if you guys don't know, um, you can probably look at the size of my body here, and you can tell that Pastor Toby loves to eat food. Yesterday, I went to San Francisco with a couple of my students, and we were just feasting in San Francisco. Raw oysters, raw clams, some sashimi. We got some baked goods from a pastry. We had pizza from Golden Boy Pizza. It was fantastic yesterday, just eating and stuff in our faces um, and just kind of splurging out a little bit, all right? But let me ask you guys this, and maybe you know this. How many days... Can a hum the average human being survive if you do not eat any food or drink any water? If you don't have any food or any water, how many days do you think the average human being can last? Yes. Three. That is correct. What is your name? Ryan. Everyone give Ryan a hand. Yeah, three days is the correct answer. Did you know that Jesus Christ went three days without food or water. And what makes it even crazier than that is that he went without food and water for this period of time because he died. And then he came back to life. And then he ate food three days later. Right? As many of you guys know, we are here today for Easter Chapel. 
And we can't begin to talk about Easter, really, the main, the core part of Easter, and so we talk about Jesus' death first. As many of you guys may have heard in your classrooms, in chapel, in Bible classes, this person that Christians worship, this man named Jesus, who actually walked the face of this earth, he died. He died. Do, you, do any of you guys know how Jesus died? How did Jesus die? Yes. Yes. He died on the cross. Jesus Christ died on a cross. Now, what, what does it mean? What is it called to die on a cross? What, what's that word that I'm looking for? Yes, what's your name? Jaina? Jaina? Crucifixion. Everyone say crucifixion. crucifixion. Very good. To be cruci crucifixion or to be crucified means to be nailed to a cross. This was a painful, horrible, and brutal death. It's a very, very, very tough, if not the toughest way for somebody to die. It was so painful, it was so brutal that they had to make up a whole new word to describe this sort of pain. You may have heard me say this before. Is this, pain, is this word called excruciating? Everyone say excruciating. Excruciating means out of the cross kind of a pain, right? X, like exit out of cruciating or crucifix, crucifixion, out of the cross kind of a pain. This is a pain that only can come through somebody dying and being nailed on a cross. It was excruciating pain. But why did Jesus even have to go through this excruciating process to begin with? Yes. It's because he wanted to forgive and wash away our sins. That's exactly correct. He wanted to take away the sins of the world. Not because he was sinful of, in, in himself, but because we, people, mankind, are sinful. And that's the big problem, right? Sin is the big problem. Why is sin such a big problem? Well, because God is holy and he hates sin. Sin is a big deal because of that. And so when we sin, we're not just breaking laws. We're not just breaking rules. We're breaking God's heart. It personally hurts him and offends him. And so because of that, there's a penalty. There's a punishment. And we deserve God's rightful punishment, which is what? Death. Separation from him. That's why the cross is such a big deal. And in some grand symbolic fashion, when Jesus went to the cross, he was fixing our problem of sin. All of our sins were placed on Jesus at the cross, where he was nailed, where he was ridiculed, and he eventually died. Now, after he died, he was taken off of this cross, and he was given to a guy who asked for Jesus' body, this guy went up to Roman, Roman officials and said, hey, hey um, I, I know this Jesus. Can I bury him in this tomb that I have set aside? And so they let him do this. And they put him in a tomb. Now this tomb wasn't a tomb that was like six feet underground in the soil. No, instead his body was put inside kind of like this rock cave with a huge heavy stone rolled in front of it. In front of this tomb, Roman soldiers stood there making sure that nobody could come and steal the body. Now, if, if that was the end of the story, if that was the end of the story, then it's like, eh, no big deal, right? Because everybody dies and stays dead, and that would be very, very normal. But that's not the case with Jesus. Because in Mark chapter 9, verse 31, he knew that he was going to die. But there's a second part that's also very true. Mark chapter 9, verse 31, it says, He said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, as they did when they crucified him, when they caused him excruciating pain. But it says that after three days, he will rise. Jesus was saying this about himself, that after three days, he will rise. That is quite a feat. That is an amazing feat. That's some super special, supernatural stuff. All right. Now, um, how many of you guys like magic shows? Raise your hand. 
Yeah? A lot of you guys do? Cool. Put your hands down. Uh, growing up, I loved watching magic shows. I grew up watching people like doing like tricks and illusions at like Pier 39 and maybe TV shows, uh, uh, TV shows or on YouTube, stuff like that. And uh, it was always cool watching these guys, Shin Lim, David Blaine, do all these really cool like illusions and magic tricks, right? At, whether it's card tricks, whether it's pulling a rabbit out of a hat, I had a teacher one time in our classroom made a dove just appear out of nowhere. We were like, oh my goodness, where did that come from? He like pulled it out of his wrist and he had his like sleeves rolled up and everything. And we're like, where did this bird come from? That is crazy. I've always been fascinated by magic. And one of my favorite tricks is seeing somebody make someone else disappear. Have you guys ever seen a magician try to do that before? You make somebody disappear? Cool, put your hands down. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Maybe it's not a person, maybe it's like a dove or some object uh, or a person disappear, right? One, per one second, somebody's standing on some box, they raise up a curtain, they count to three, they drop the curtain, person's gone. And it's amazing and everybody goes wild and everybody cheers. Well, I don't know if you know this about me, but because of my fascination with magic and, and illusions, I wanted to learn how to make things disappear as well. And over the past few years, I've been practicing a lot at home. And I've gotten actually pretty good with this. Now, I was like, I can make one of you guys disappear, but then your teacher might get really mad at me, so I don't want to do that. So then I was like, all right, let's try to make a ball disappear. So you guys want to see a, you guys want to see a magic demonstration? Yeah, all right, cool. I have a wonderful Nerf ball. Nerf, like, you know, just a little foamy, soft thing. And I have the magic towel. Now, there's nothing special about it. There's nothing, there's nothing, right? There's no mirrors, no nothing, like nothing in here, right? Nothing at all, right? Front row, you guys see? Nothing, nothing at all, all normal, 100% normal. Okay, cool. I will attempt to make this ball disappear, okay? I just put this towel right over my arm, nothing, nothing hidden, right? Nothing, nothing, nothing hidden here, right? Check this out. Everyone ready? One, two, three. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I know, a standing ovation, I can't believe it. This, this is amazing, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Woo! That was so good. So, so good, right? Well, wasn't that just amazing, everyone? It was awesome, right? Imagine right before your very own eyes. That was beautiful. Now, make it appear again? Oh, that's for another day, my friend. I'm gonna bring it back like that. All right, now, you guys saw what happened. The truth is, I'm not a good magician. I had about five seconds of practice before this today, and that was about it, right? Now, if you believed me that I could actually make something disappear, you were sorely wrong, and I apologize for leading you down that wrong path. The truth is, no one can, not even the professionals. That's why they're called illusions, they're tricks, something to trick your eye into, or your brain into thinking that something is actually true. You can't really make something disappear out of thin air. Now today I'm not here to talk about magic or disappearing bodies or anything like that, well, kind of. I'm here to talk about something actually real, the story of Easter and what happened to Jesus' body. Luke chapter 24, verses one through eight says this. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and they went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. <gasps> Missing body. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men, these angels, said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you back in Mark chapter 9, verse 31? 
while he was with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified on the third day, be raised again. Then they remembered his words. Christ died. He was put into that tomb. Roman soldiers placed in front of that tomb to make sure that nobody would steal that body. But what happens? Three days later, a few of Jesus' friends, girls, came to pay their respects at the cemetery, at the tomb. But yet before they got there, something crazy happened. It says that two angels, bright as lightning, were standing there with them. The tomb had already been, the rock had already been rolled away. Two angels were standing there with them. And the book of Matthew tells us that the, these soldiers, the Roman soldiers that were there also saw the angels as well. And when they did, these ladies here in this passage, they fell to the ground. The Roman soldiers also fell to the ground. The guards were so afraid, Matthew 28 says, that they shook and became like dead men. So I want you to imagine this scene with me, okay? Imagine the scene, soldiers lying on the ground, angels standing near the tomb, and then Jesus' friends arrive, and they see all this. They see these two angels, bright as lightning. They're kind of freaked out. They're scared. The angel goes, please, please, please. Don't, don't be scared. Don't be scared. Don't be scared. I know who you're looking for. You're looking for Jesus, right? The guy who died on the cross just a couple days earlier? Yeah, he's not here. He is risen. He has risen. And they're like, wait, what? How? That... That doesn't normally naturally happen. How could a dead body just actually magically just arise and, and disappear because they hadn't seen him yet? These ladies were skeptical. They were unsure of what the angels were telling them. And so the angel said, okay, you don't believe us? Come inside. Step into this tomb and check it out for yourselves. And so they did. The women went into the tomb. They looked around, empty. The body was gone, just some cloth that was lying there. Immediately, these women, they run back to tell their disciple friends. Now, while they're running back to tell their disciples, the Roman guards also went to their government leaders as well. They ran back to the palace or the whatever building it was to tell the leaders what had happened. And they're like, wait... The leader says to the guard, what, what, what just happened? What are you telling me? You only had one job to do, soldiers. You only had one job to do, guard the body. Make sure nobody comes and takes it. Are you telling me that the one thing that you were tasked to do, you failed at? Are you telling me that that one body I told you to guard is gone? <sighs> this is horrible for the government. And so they had to scheme, they had to come up with a plan how are we going to explain this missing body? This is what they came up with. Matthew 28, verse 12 and 13. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, bribery, telling them, you are to say, this is their script. His disciples, his followers, came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. You guys got that? If anybody comes, if anybody asks, hey, what happened to his body? Just like, we were sleeping, and his disciples came when it was dark, and, and they rolled that stone away, and then they took the body, and then they left. Now, of course, that's a lie, right? And it's very, very possible to kind of disprove this lie. Because, uh, well, think about what they had to do, what they had to convince people of. Is this actually possible, right? We know the truth, that it's actually pretty easy to disprove this lie. First of all, just think about it. Can a huge stone, a heavy rock, be rolled away without disturbing any sleep at all between multiple soldiers? Might be hard. In addition, and the bigger question, if they were asleep, how do they know it was the disciples that came? Your eyes are closed. Or if you're not, and it's kind of like cracked open a little bit, like you're not visibly seeing things, 
in front of you, you wouldn't be able to see anything. So how would they be able to clearly identify, oh, it was the disciples that came and stole the body and ran away with it. No, Jesus' body wasn't stolen. It couldn't have been. He resurrected. And to fully prove it, let's look at Luke chapter 24. This happens after Jesus resurrected. The disciples were hiding, huddling in a house. It says, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, uh, why are you troubled? And why do, you, um, why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I, myself, touch me and see. A ghost doesn't have flesh and bones as you see I have. Verse 40, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, um, do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it at, and ate it in their presence. This is a hilarious scene to me. It's a very funny scene when you think about all the little details. Disciples were gathered in a house. They were worried for their lives because they saw what happened to Jesus. They didn't want that to happen to them. And so they hid. But while they were doing that, while they were talking in this little huddle inside the house, Jesus pops up in the middle of all of them. Surprise! Everybody sees him, but nobody believes him. He's like, look, my hands, my feet. You guys see the scars? They still don't believe him. So he says this that's highlighted here. Excuse me, guys. Do you have anything to eat? Right? I started talking about food at the beginning of this message. How long can somebody last without food and water? Three days. It's been that time now. He's been dead for three days, starving. And he says, anybody have food? It says here, the disciples gave him some broiled fish. And verse 43 says, he ate it in their presence. Why does he do that? Why not just talk about the good old memories, the good old times that they shared in the past? No. He wanted to prove that he was a truly live human being. Right? The pastor said earlier, they thought they saw a ghost. They thought they were like having some sort of hallucination or something like that. They thought he was a ghost, but ghosts don't eat fish. Ghosts can't cause food to disappear like he was. So he just, nom, 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 eats fish right in front of their face. Jesus ate to prove that he is the risen son of God. And that, my friends, is what Easter is all about. It's not about eggs. It's not about chocolate bunnies or anything like that. It's all about Jesus and his power over death. It's about a risen Savior. It's all about Jesus' res resurrection. How he overcame death with death. How he went from death to life. And how he can provide for us too that same thing. Life from death. We do not sing or serve a dead God. We sing to a living Savior. And God wants you to follow him. And God wants you to follow this living Savior as well. Now, to follow Jesus, that's a huge decision to make. I get it. I understand. It's one that requires us to die to ourselves the way Jesus died on the cross. That we have to surrender ourselves and our will to him. But if you find Jesus as somebody worth following, guys, I encourage you. Talk to me. Talk to your teachers about following Jesus, what it really means to be a disciple of Christ. Let's celebrate Easter this upcoming week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for today. Thank you for giving us a chance to look at not a magic show, not an illusion, but a true story and a true fact that God, your son, Jesus Christ, died and rose again, appeared to many to prove his existence, ate fish in front of them to show that he was fully human being, Lord. And I pray that as we continue on with chapel, as we continue on and carry on into next week and spring break and Easter Sunday and everything, Lord, 
that we will always remember that we're not just celebrating it just to have a, a vacation and a week off from school, but we are to celebrate the death and resurrection and life of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, for your love. Thank you for dying for our sins when we never deserved it. And I pray, Lord, that through our school here that we will be able to develop more and more students who want to follow you and find you worthy of following and surrendering to, Lord. Pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you.
Thank you, Corral. Guys, that gave me goosebumps. It was so beautiful. Let's give him another hand. Okay, I'm here to hand out Spelling Bee Awards. Um, fourth and fifth grade already got theirs, but I forgot to tell the fourth and fifth graders that in the final round of Spelling Bee, 16 people move on to the final round from, uh, let's see, there were seven schools here, I believe. Um, of those 16 people, eight of them were CCS students. That is phenomenal. So what we're going to do is I'm going to call your names. We want you to come up and get your certificates. We'd like for you to hold your applause till the end because uh, we need to have chapel done soon. Um, but we want those of you getting your certificates to remain here so that Mrs. Lovett can get a picture. So to begin, this is sixth grade, Brian Lynn. Please hold your applause. Mabel Zhang earned third place in sixth grade, and she also went to the final round and earned fifth place. Bernice Yu earned second place in the, in the, fifth, in the sixth grade round. And Quinn Nguyen earned first place for sixth grade. I'll let you clap now. It's hard to keep from it. Okay, on to seventh grade. Okay, Chloe Chin earned fifth place. And Alan Ao earned third place. And eighth grade, Sonia Lau earned second place. She, I wondered, if, oh, you are here. Yay, come on up, yes. And then she, in the final round, she also earned second place. And in the eighth grade B, Winnie Zhao earned first place. And that is it. Let's clap. Okay, we are so proud of you guys. Thank you so much. You may be seated. All right, let's give them another round of applause. Awesome. Gr great work in the spelling bee. Um, so I just have a quick announcement that Ram Run is coming up, which some of you know about. And we're raising money for a new gym floor and also to help Ethiopia uh, buy a, 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 a community in Ethiopia, which you can learn more about when you walk past that wall over there after chapel. Um, but I just want to remind you that we're having it and there's a rally tomorrow after school, so bring your energy. You will be receiving t-shirts today, so you need to re wear the t-shirts to the rally. Okay, a sea of orange needs to be out on that field, all right? Um, so with that said, that's the only announcement I had, and I'm happy to bring up uh, BACBC's wonderful head pastor, Pastor Steve, who's going to close out for us. Thank you, Mrs. Lovett. Um, I was the one who gave announcements this morning. So anyway, let's close in a prayer, okay? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. You loved us so much. You sent your one and only son, Jesus. He became one of us, just like every one of us sitting here. And he, uh, he ate, he slept, he walked, he worked. And yet, ultimately, his goal was to be our savior. And to die on that cross, as Pastor Toby shared with us. But then, victoriously, by his power and the Father's power and the Holy Spirit's power, he came alive again. And each of us have the opportunity to have a relationship with him. So I pray for every student, Lord, that they would have a relationship with Jesus. They would choose to follow him, a very serious and important decision, as Pastor Toby shared with us, and that we would know you as our personal Lord and Savior. So bless each student uh, this day and, and faculty. Um, I pray that if, none of, if there are some that don't know you, they would seek out a teacher or someone. And that, so that we all can experience that great blessing of having you as our Heavenly Father. So thank you for this time. 
in this chapel. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Steve. All right, give him a round of applause. And if you ever see Pastor Steve on campus, which he's here, go talk to him. He's a really cool guy, okay? All right. We are going to dismiss, and I think, who's in here? Fourth grade. You may go.